<laughs> okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Okay, so I do a lot of diversity trainings in my office, and I only like to do things if you guys respond to me back. All right. So cool. how y'all doing? Good. 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 All right. So I like to laugh, have a good time. Um, and so I'm very grateful to be up here. Um, my name is Kendra Gaines. I am an African American Initiatives Program Coordinator in the Office of Multicultural Student Success. That's a lot of words, right? Um, so yes, I program for um, African. I create programs for African American students, but in the Office of OMSS, um, all our programs are open to all students. So stop by, come say hi. We try to have food. Try to talk about um, anime. I'm not into anime, but my <laughs> coworker is. Um, and so yeah, so very happy to be here. Um, the title of my presentation is The Ugly Experiences of African American Girls, and it's based off the book The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Um, bear with me, I have had a lot of thoughts and a lot of words, so I'm going to read it from paper. Um, so, yes. Um, so, I'll be honest, as I, when this opportunity was presented um, to me to speak at this event, I really didn't know much about banned books. I didn't know um, about censorship a lot. So, this opportunity allowed me to study, research, and understand more about freedom of reading books and how the books are private and among private institutions are banned or censored. And so this has been very enlightening for me. And I got to understand the importance of freedom to read about topics and themes that highlight like sexual abuse, racism, and many more hard topics. Um, I was also very intrigued to read this book, um, the Tony Morrison Blue's Eye. Um, because it was raised one of the most banned books, and I'm a trouble starter. Um, little minutes, I'm the youngest child and grandchild, so I like to try right? People we'll yell at the baby, right? Um, so I really thought this was an interesting book, and especially the topics that are discussed were really important to me. Um, because I saw so many parallels from my life, as well as many other black girls' lives, um, that Tony, Tony Morrison talked about. Um, so there's two things I want to just go over with you guys and talk to you guys about. Is that cool? All right. <laughs> So the first one is whiteness as the standard of beauty. Um, in the book, The Bullet's Eye, it provides an extended depiction of the incomparable standard of beauty um, among black girls and women that struggle to achieve these beauty standards. Um, whiteness um, is superior and everywhere, including the white baby doll that Claudia, the idealization of Shirley Temple. Um, I know Shirley Temple was a big deal. She was like a staple of beauty for younger girls um, back in during this time. And also that um, the main character desired that she had blue eyes, blue eyes because she thought it would make her more beautiful. She thought it would be comparable to getting respect, to be loved, and things like that. Um, and um, adult women having to learn to hate blackness, um, their own bodies, take this hatred out on their own children. And um, in this um, part where Mrs. Greek Love shares the conviction that Bacola is ugly and lighter skinned, Geraldine curses Bacola's blackness. Claudia remains free from this worship of whiteness, imaging Bacola's unborn baby as beautiful in its blackness. Because it's hinted that once Claudia reaches adolescence, she will too learn to hate herself as a racial self-loathing or a necessary part of maturation. And I wanted to read a quote to you guys from the book. The quote is, that it tastes must be for her, her blackness, all things in her are flux and anticipation, but her blackness is static and dread. And it is the blackness that accounts for that creates the vacuum edge with this taste in her white eyes. And what I wanted to talk about regarding this theme was how kind of like I grew up. So I grew up with this skin complexion. Um, my parents are lighter. Um, I've always deemed them as much lighter, but to them, they were like, I'm the same color as you. No, you're not. You don't have the struggle of being a darker skin complexion African American woman. And um, now you see a lot of it's black owned everything. It's Black Lives Matter um, a lot here. Um, and I didn't grow up looking, seeing my own organic hair or Tracy Ellis Ross selling pattern in the stores. Um, or even black owned designers being in my favorite stores. Um, that wasn't my reality. I grew up with, I think it was Pantene had a kids um, shampoo and it was like shaking a fish and all the little girls had straight hair. I, this is like my most fondest memory growing up. And I remember thinking, oh my God, what a blessing it is to like take a shower every day and wash your hair, right? It's not every Sunday that your mom sits you in the sink and washes your hair. But I didn't understand that those were Trade. Those are the things that I had. I would have loved and appreciated. And when I have children, 
that's going to be the same thing as the generational thing that I'm going to share with them, right? But it was like painful to me because it was like, why can't I just wash my hair like the girls in school? And why can't I just have this lighter skin complexion? And so, and even another thing was I was big into dolls growing up. So there wasn't a wide variety of them. My mom and dad had to search hard to find these dolls that looked like me. And at this point, at a certain point, I was like, quit looking. Just give me a light skinned doll so I can play with it, right? Give me a white doll. You know, they're prettier, their hair is straighter. Um, and so I grew up hating being dark skinned. I would run from being. Um, getting tanned in the summer. I hate coming back from some vacation because every time the person that came out of people's mouths was, wow, you got so dark. And it was like, ask me how my trip went. Ask me, did I have fun? Ask me, how was my first cruise? How was Florida? You know, why is my skin complexion? So I grew to hate it. And I started to notice that my friends that were lighter skin complexion, my friends that, um, but even my family members that are light skin complexion as well um, were treated a little differently. Guys in high school, guys would ask them one day, guys would ask them to prom. I did not. Um, my cousins, I felt like, were treated differently. They weren't in trouble as much. I did mention I'm a menace, but you have to be among other menaces to be a menace, right? It doesn't just start with you, especially in the area of the youngest. So it was actually quite awakening because a lot of my cousins aren't the same skin complexion as me. Um, or if they are, they have pretty eyes, they have softer hair, and it was like, well, what's, what's wrong with me? And I would always joke and tell them I'm adopted. And that's not true at all, but it was like, my parents don't look like me, right? They're not the same kind of skin complexion. So I could definitely relate with, with the characters in this because she desired to be something that was more appreciated, you know? And I understand that colorism is real and that um, European culture is accepted and appreciated within the black community. And I didn't understand that at in my adolescence years, right? And it wasn't until I got into high school where I really learned to love and appreciate who I was and accept me for being this dark skinned, chocolate, beautiful woman, right? I had to love what I saw. And I used to wake up being a child and say, God, when I wake up, please let me be light skinned. And that, like, that's that's so absurd, right? That's ridiculous. But that's the culture. That's what we were taught. You know, keep your hair straight. Right? So I'm saying this with my hair straight now. But that was a choice because I wanted to. <laughs> I feel closer obligated. But it was just a hardship that we had I had to overcome. And growing up, we didn't talk about it. But as I've gotten older, I've had many friends with like I had to die per my year too. Like I got to, you know, I felt I would get to do this. It sucked having to not be appreciated because of my skin complexion, you know, X, Y, and Z. So that's the really the correlation that I can really understand with this book. And I appreciate that Tony Morrison took the time to talk about this because for me it was just being lighter skin. But for in during this time, they it was a it was a, you were treated better because you were white. You were treated better because you had lighter eyes. So I understood and I got that and I felt I resonated with these characters in that regard. And so, yeah. So the second thing that I did want to discuss was the sexual initiation and abuse. Um, in the book, I discussed a lot about sexual initiation. Um, and when I say sexual initiation, do you guys know what that means? That means either being forcibly, you know, sexually molested or abused and whatnot, as well as um, that is becoming a woman um, and you being forced into womanhood. And early in the book, Nicola was the first, had her first menstrual period. And toward the end of not the book, she has her first sexual experience, which is violent. And then another character, she was forced to have sex in front of two white men. And it's, it's deep in that that hurt, that she, her, their sexual experience had to be humiliated and forced, and it couldn't have been what she wanted to, it to be. And, excuse me, and all these experiences are humiliating and hurtful, and they indicated that sexual coming of age is fraught um, with peril, especially in abusive environments. And what I really took from this was that um, in the book, parents carry much of the blame for their children's often traumatic sexual coming of ages. Uh, which is real because parents might feel like I took, you know, why was I there? Why didn't I stand up for my child? How did that happen? But at the same time, sometimes parents take it out on the children um, because what were you doing is often the blame. You know, we, we slut shame young girls or women or men for being raped. And it's like, what did I do? I didn't do anything. And so I felt like this thing was consistent within the black community because young girls are told to dress more appropriately when men come over. Um, and I've experienced that with my own friends. I've experienced that with growing up. 
I was a kid that liked to be free. I didn't like wearing clothes, and the less clothes, the better, right? I'm a summer child, and my birthday's in the winter. Um, and I was always told, go get, put more clothes on. This person is coming over, right? My dad owned a business, and he had meetings at the house. Why? I'm sorry, Uncle John Doe is uncomfortable and is hypersexualizing me, right? And it was the same, I felt like that was consistent with this book, and I was and I appreciate Tony Morrison for being so honest about our experiences because um, young black girls are being blamed or accused of being fast. When I say fast, that means they were moving beyond their years. They were trying to be more adult or woman-like or sexually advancing, and that's not always the case. Um, and oh, excuse me. Um, and there's um, a perversive assumption in the book that women's bodies are available for abuse, and that's not at all the message that we're trying to ever give off, right? You're, I'm, because I dress so much, because I am who I am, because I'm, my body is progressing further. If I could stop it, I would, but my body is progressing further than what it should at this age. Now you're telling me that I'm open to doing whatever, right? You, it's okay for you to touch me. It's okay for you to do X, Y, and Z. And so um, the refusal of parents to teach their girls about sexuality makes the girls transition into sexual maturity difficult. Parents are having honest conversations. Parents are not saying the words that is actually happening. It's called abuse. It's called sexual assault. Don't say don't touch my no-no parts. Let's call those body parts what they are, right? And that's what sometimes allows abusers to think it's okay because, oh, I didn't know it was this. Um, I didn't know it was that. You know, and she used this word to talk about her body because that's what we taught our kids. And growing up, that's what my family, we use nicknames for body parts. We never, you know, we don't have a problem calling arm arm. But let's talk about women genitalia and men genitalia. Like, we don't call it those things. I don't know if that's the same in all cultures, but I'm just speaking from the Black experience. Um, but the problems in sexual violence in, in the book suggest that racism is not the only thing that distorts Black girlhood. Black girls are hypersexualized um, and struggle to dress the way they want because in the eyes of society, women are, are not allowed to dress the way they want. Um, or not allowed to dress certain ways. But according to the National Center of Violence Against Women in the Black Community, one in four girls will be sexually abused at the age of 18. And it's tragic that that's the reality of us. You know, all identities struggle with sexual abuse. Um, but I could see from it because I know friends and family that are struggling day to day with gang relationships or being told that they were hypersexualized, you know, or they weren't allowed to, or no one believed them. Um, because of the experience that they had, whether it was the friend of the family, a stranger, or a close family, a close kin. Um, and so, in conclusion, I just want to share with you the ugly truth that many Black girls, like myself, have experienced. Um, and this is a call to action to advocate and support Black girls throughout their adolescence. Believe them when they mention they're uncomfortable um, around certain people and encourage them to love themselves. Um, for who they are, no matter what shape, size, or color that they are. Um, and Black women deserve to have a joyful um, experiences that last long throughout their childhood, throughout their teenage, and even into their adulthood. And lastly, this is a call to action to advocate for freedom to read challenging books like the bluest eye. Um, you know, don't just let this event be this one event. Advocate, continue to advocate and support, um, and talk loudly. So your friends, you know, read this. I know it makes us uncomfortable, but it's important, right? You know, certain identities and categories that we talk about within identities, we don't always understand what these things mean. Um, and we'd rather just push away than actually engage in it. Um, does anybody know Sammy Spann? Right? Um, very prominent um, figure, VP of Student Affairs. He says, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. So when you decide to jump, life finally begins. And sometimes we have to hone in and lean into that discomfort to understand other people and to understand truly what's happening, right? So that's it. My name is Kendra, and that's my. You guys get some great goodies, by the way. I'm very grateful. Thank you. <laughs>